Hello, Westside Family Church. How are we doing today? It is great to see you here in the North Sanctuary and the South Sanctuary. Hello to our friends over there in Speedway and online. I want to give a shout out to uh, Greg and Kathy Blatt from Flower Mound, Texas. Good to see you guys. And uh, why don't we give it up for everybody out there in our online audience. And as Jason mentioned earlier in the front end of the service, this is Impact Sunday, where you get to discover how you can make a global impact as an individual or as a family. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that later in the service. And I just wanna give a shout out to Derek Nunley, and uh, he's the global outreach director and his team for the amazing job they do to keep us connected to the world. So give those guys a hand as well. <clears throat> And cannot think of a better day to talk about what we are going to talk about today, because we are talking about time. Now, it's part of a larger conversation we've been having as we've been going through these 30 key ideas of the Bible called believe. And when we look at believe, it's really broken down into three major categories. It's 10 key beliefs, 10 key practices, and 10 key virtues. And today we are in week eight of our key practices and we're focusing on the topic of offering my time. So if you have a Bible with pages that turn or a screen that scrolls, let me encourage you to come over here to Ephesians chapter five or page 289 in your Believe book if you have that with you today. So a number of years ago, there's a really cool movie out that really got you thinking about life and about time. It's called The Bucket List and Jack Nicholson uh, actually played billionaire Edward Cole, whose world was turned upside down when his cancer left him with one year to live. And so he put together a bucket list of all the things that he wanted to do now that he had clarity and how he could make the most of the time that he had left. And the rest of the movie kind of plays out as Nicholson is doing all the different things that he wanted to do and should have done, but he never got around to because he was too busy uh, being consumed with himself and building his business empire. But here's what happened. His cancer gave him clarity to discover his priorities. Now, I don't wish for anybody listening to this message that you find out that you have less than a year to live, but I do wish for every single one of us to live with a sense of clarity that Edward Cole has, and that is to live like we were dying. For us to see time as a gift from God, that we would never take it for granted, that we would never miss out on the invitation to live every moment as if it were our last. And this doesn't mean uh, to be uh, dark and brooding or to scare anybody or cause anybody to go out and get a screening, unless you need to go and get a screening. But it's just because the leadership of Westside cares so much about you and your spiritual journey that we wanna bring a theological and biblical perspective to this precious commodity that we have been given called time. Now, there is a guy who's written a lot of the Bible. His name is Paul. Uh, we often refer to him as the Apostle Paul, led a lot of people to Jesus, planted a lot of churches, wrote a lot of letters to those churches, which we now know as the New Testament. And he had some very, very interesting things to say about the subject of time. Ephesians 5, he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, uh, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. This is actually a warning. And if you look at the phrase, be very careful, uh, you might first look at something like that, like, hey, honey, here's your milk. Be careful you don't spill it. No, it's much stronger than that. It's a warning. It's the same phrase that Jesus used when he warned all of his disciples about the hypocritical religious leaders of the day. And the words that he used were, be on your guard. Be on your guard. Because in Paul's mind, we have a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity to make an impact with our lives. Now, the Greeks, they knew all about this. 
And so they actually came up with two different words that are translated time. There is chronos and there is kairos. Chronos time is days and hours and minutes and seconds, but kairos time is like the opportune time, precious moments that we actually have. And if you go back and look at this phrase, making the most of every opportunity, it's actually the Greek phrase, exa goritsamenoi ton kairon. Say that together with me. No, not really. But literally, it's translated redeeming the time. Redeeming, it's an it's a idea that came out of purchasing things in the marketplace, the agora back then. And he's saying, you need to buy back time. You need to seize these kairos moments when you get the chance. And why? He says, because the days are evil. They were evil back then and they are evil today because we are living in a culture that is not the way that it's supposed to be. We are living in a culture where we need to bring light into the darkness because there are people without food. There are villages without water. There are children being trafficked. There are boys and girls who are orphans and have no parents. There are friends who don't have Jesus. There are countries that don't have the gospel. And this isn't right. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. And this is why Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because he wants to work in and through us to cooperate with him, to bring shalom into a fractured and broken humanity that is out of harmony with God. And that's why this key question is so important. Let's read this together. How do I best use my time to serve God and others? It's a huge question to ask. And I have to tell you, I'm really encouraged by what I see you guys doing. You know, we did this reveal study a while back and it was designed to take a snapshot of our congregation to find out where we are in our spiritual journey. And there was a question that was asked about us offering our time. It was stated this way, I serve those in need on my own one to two times a month or more. And the percentage of you who said yes was actually 35%, and that's pretty cool. And way to go if that's you. But we still have some work to do on the rest of us as the 65%. And we're gonna come alongside you because, and I don't know if you know this, but the number one reason that people state that they can't move forward in their spiritual life, that they get stalled and they don't make a greater impact with their life is margin. Margin with their time and margin with their money. And so this fall, we're gonna do a series called Margin. Uh, it's actually a movement because we are partnering with up to 100 other churches in the Kansas City area and with the Dave Ramsey Solutions. And we're gonna bring Financial Peace University to our church and to up to 100 other churches. And we are gonna learn how to create margin with our time and create margin with our money. And we're thinking God is gonna do something revolutionary in our city. Are you ready for that? Yeah. It's gonna be super, super cool. Yeah, you can give God praise for that because it is happening right now. And you're gonna hear a lot more on that later. Now, when it comes to the subject of time, there, there's something that we all kind of think alike on, and that is we don't really think we have time. Because we say things like, uh, well, I don't really have time. <laughs> but the reality is you do have time, and I do have time, we do have time. In fact, not only do you have time, and stay with me here, you actually have extra. Shut up. You, you no, know, you don't know my life. No, no, I get it. I get it. We actually have extra. Most of us have jobs. There's seven days in a week, but we only have to work five of those days, and we have two days off. Unheard of in most areas of the world. Others of us have jobs where our employer comes to us and says, hey, here's the deal. I want for one week, two week, three week, four week, five weeks, I want you not to show up. But I'm going to pay you anyway. <laughs> what? And yet, statistically, Americans serve people less than other people in the world who actually have less time. 
And you know why that is? It's because we have options. We have options what to do with our time. So we get a little bit of extra time. We get a few hours or maybe we get an extra day. We get a week off or something like that. And we're like, ooh, how can I take all that time and use it to do something that I enjoy? You say, Scott, are you against enjoying time off? No, 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 no. But we have to be careful about this because we live in a culture that programs us to ask this question. What can I do with my extra time for, say it with me, me? And we all get drug into this. Because we've all had this experience. You know, you go to a movie and you spend a few hours there. Wasn't really that good. And you're like, eh, I wouldn't recommend it. Or you go to a restaurant and you spend a lot of money and a lot of time there and you walk away and you're like, ah, I probably won't go back. Or you go on vacation, and it was okay, but it rained, and you got sunburn. <laughs> but you take a day, and you gather with your life group or some other friends, and you fix up a neighborhood, or you offer some of your time to somebody in hospice, or you give some of your time to the homeless, or you provide respite care for a, uh, a foster parent, you never walk away from a moment like that and go, well, that was a waste of time. Uh-uh, never. In fact, if you're anything like me, something happens inside of you and you go, wow, I was made for this. Because you were. Because God has hardwired you to offer your time to make an impact. And here's the invitation from this text. Leverage your chronos time to make kairos moments. And we need this challenge because we all have a tendency to procrastinate. Right? We say things like, someday, yeah, you know, someday I'm going to get around to that. Someday I'm going to pray for my neighbors. You know, someday I'm going to get into the rhythm and the practice of serving others with my time. Someday I'm going to go on a mission trip. Someday I'm going to sponsor a child. Someday. True story that was run in the LA Times. A guy went back to his old neighborhood. He had purchased his house that he had left 20 years prior to that time. He goes into the house. He hadn't been there in 20 years. He goes up into the attic. Hadn't been there in 20 years. Finds a jacket of his that's been there for 20 years. And he's just kind of roaming around and he reaches in a pocket and he pulls out a little ticket. It's a ticket for a shoe repair that he had taken in 20 years before and had forgotten all about the shoes. On a whim, he goes into the neighborhood to see if the store is actually there. It's still there. He walks into the shoe repair store. The same guy is actually working at the counter. He reaches in his pocket and he hands the guy the ticket. The guy looks at it. He goes into the back room. He kind of mills around for about five minutes, comes back and hands the guy the ticket back. And he says, they'll be ready on Friday. <laughs> true story. But isn't that true about us? You're like, well, you know, someday I get around to it. Someday may be the most dangerous word in the English language. See, here's the deal. The problem with someday is that it robs us of this day, of this moment. Now, this day is what Jesus was a master at. Jesus never wasted time. Jesus never invested his time in something he wasn't called to do. Jesus never hurried. You never read about Jesus running anywhere. You ever notice that? Which, by the way, is why we tell kids not to run in church. It's just to be like Jesus, okay? That's all. Jesus always did what his father instructed him to do at this time, and he always waited for the right moment to do the right thing. In John 7, Jesus' brothers, who didn't believe that he was the Messiah, and kind of mocked him and goaded him for believing that he was, actually was trying to get him to move out and do something that God had not really called him to do yet. And, and this is the way that John reports it. 
They said, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourselves to the world. And Jesus has the most interesting reply to that. He simply says, my time is not yet here. Now, what's that mean? My time is not yet here. I mean, you're, you're here. No, 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 I'm here, but it's not my time. This is not the moment. And what Jesus is essentially saying is, oh, I know what's going on, and I'm going to leverage my Kairos moment. So when my heavenly Father says, go, then I'm going to go. And I'm going to go to a cross, and I'm going to offer myself for the sacrifice of the sins of all humanity, and I will secure salvation for all eternity, everyone who will believe. That's my time. And Jesus lived it, and he invites us to invest your time in eternity. If you want the greatest ROI, if you want the, the guaranteed great return on your investment, then I would advise you to invest your time in doing things. When you stand before your heavenly father, he's going to say, well done, man. You did exactly what I wanted you to do with your time. And I can tell you the one thing for your one life that is going to give you that kind of guaranteed return on your investment is when you invest in people. The stuff simply will not matter in the end. Now, who are the people, and how are the people, and where are the people? That's not the issue. God is going to give you a lot of freedom to make choices in that area. God's not going to box you in. In fact, this is really the, the point of our, our key verse, and let's just read this together. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, it doesn't matter if you're a CEO or you're a plumber or you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a teacher. It doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't matter what your daily activity is. It doesn't matter if you've got uh, 24 hours that you're totally focused on something or if you've got two. It doesn't matter. He says, whatever you do, and the ask that we are going to make of you later in the service, whether you pray or sponsor, write or go or explore, whatever you do, do it, this is what Jesus says, to the glory of God. Another way of saying it is that you offer your time as an act of worship. You want to worship God? You do it with your time. It's not just coming into this room and singing songs. It's how you leverage your kairos moments as an offering to Almighty God. In response to everything that God has done for you, you take your time and you put it in your hands like this and you say to God, this isn't my time it's your time. Everybody say, it's not my time. It's not my time. This is God's time. You do that, I guarantee you, God will lead you to a place of maximum impact. Now, in the bucket list, Edward Cole did some phenomenal things. He checked off his list. He, uh, he, he uh, went to the, to the pyramids. He climbed Mount Everest. But there was one thing that eluded him, and that was to kiss the most beautiful girl in the world. But in the end, he reconciled with his daughter, who then introduced him to the granddaughter that he never knew he had. And when Edward Cole stooped down and kissed her on the cheek, his bucket list was complete. Because he realized of all the things that he had put on his list, the most important one was fixing relationships. And when it comes to offering your time, if you're not sure where to start, that's one that you might want to put on your list. And so today, 
we come to this door of offering my time. And when we open it, when we unlock it, and we lean in to this being a way of life. And let's say it together. I invest my time in fulfilling God's purposes. And when you come through this door and you hold your time out to God like that, and this is your mantra, God just might change your bucket list. For many years, we traveled and, and watched uh, the Jayhawks. One uh, uh, disappointing season ending game, uh, we were heading back and we were just talking, you know, there's, there's more to life, there's more to uh, church, there's more to God's mission for us than uh, just follow the Jayhawks around. So we uh, took into uh, uh, prayer and um, uh, through prayer decided that it was uh, a mission trip that would be our next adventure. And so we, we went to Thailand and ex it, was, it was tough because we had never been um, to another country. But it was, it was wonderful to see what God was doing. Because my idea of a mission trip was hammer nails and fixing stuff. And we did not do that. We were fixing relationships with individuals, with kids and the adults that are on staff there uh, to we were fixing relationship with Jesus and with us. After we got home from Thailand, we knew that we wanted to make a difference. We saw what One Life does. They feed the kids, they teach them about Jesus, they make sure that they have an education and that they're loved and cared for. And so we wanted to make sure that we took part in that. One Saturday morning, I just felt really, really strong about praying about where God was leading us this year. And after, uh, after I finished praying, I got a phone call, like in five or 10 minutes. And God said, ask us if we would go to South Africa. I was like, no way. South Africa is not where I want to go. But I wanted to be obedient. And oh my goodness, South Africa is the place that God wants us to be. It's been amazing just seeing what is happening with One Life and the kids over there. To wrap my arms and my mind around the villages that we went into, it's just, um, it wowed me in so many different ways. We also go into this unincorporated parts of this big city of Port Elizabeth where there's despair and, and poverty. But when you get your mind past that and you relationship and engage with teenagers and kids that had the same desire in life to live and hear about Jesus, it's beautiful. And so South Africa has become our mission. Not that anything we've done, we've just been obedient to what God's called us to do. I love kids. I love teenagers and I engage and I get to engage. There's violence, there's drug abuse, there's, there's physical abuse and, and alcohol abuse and, and just not a, um, a good environment. For us to be able to go and, and just love on those is so, so vital, so important. So last year we got to meet our, our third sponsored child, which is Snow, and she's an orphan because both of her parents have died from AIDS. And so it was special to meet this beautiful little girl. And see her just being herself, <laughs> that will put a smile on your face. So when it came to sponsoring a child, I, I didn't want an emotional attachment, just a financial commitment. But when I saw Mike, Sandy, and Sano together, I knew I was missing out. Two weeks after I left Sano in South Africa, I was in India at a One Life Children's Home. And I found myself for the first time face to face with Monica, my One Life sponsored child. And, and just like that, just like that, in the blink of an eye, our lives were changed. Our lives were transformed. 
she cried tears of joy and I just, I just held her. She, she was just amazed. She couldn't believe that somebody would, would care enough to give her a shot at life. I studied in New Life 11 years and waited a long time to my, meet my sponsor. So I was very happy. When I first time meet him, I call him daddy. That was the first best feeling. To have the opportunity, the opportunities for each and every one of us is to engage and say yes, I am going to be a part of this one life. And sponsor a kid, uh, that's a no-brainer. And the end result, whether you meet them or not, is let, just trust me, it's beautiful. When someone invests their time, their life, in something that matters, it's beautiful and it's redemptive. So the question now becomes, how are you going to redeem your time? Now, it might feel a little overwhelming to start to think that way because there are so many options in front of you. You may not even know where to start. And so we're here to help. In fact, that's what we do around here at Westside. We help and equip people to love Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus. And we have prepared a list of ideas for you to offer your time in ways that will give an eternal and a global and an exponential return. And we've placed them on the back of your program right here. So pull that out right there on the back of your program. We're going to go through each of these. The first way that you can offer your time is to pray tap into eternity. When I travel, it doesn't really matter which of our partners that I talk to, whether it's in South Africa, India, Laos, or Thailand, they constantly ask us to pray for them because they have learned a counterintuitive reality about time. There is way too much to do and not enough time to do it with. You feel me, right? So they understand that with prayer, they're able to tap into unlimited time, the eternity that God possesses. Because what would normally take years, God can accomplish in days. So in your program, we've also included an insert to help you pray for our global partners. And I want you to know something else, that these partners, they pray for you. In fact, they pray that God will bless and continue to favor Westside and the sponsors, well, they hold a special place in their hearts and in the hearts of our kids. In fact, many of these kids, they know their sponsor's name and they pray for you by name. In fact, on Fridays, they fast for you. Now I wanna ask you something. Do you think that God hears the prayers of gratitude as they pray for their sponsor and they fast for their sponsor? Oh yeah, you better believe it. And speaking of sponsors, that's another great way to make a difference is by sponsoring a child because it really does make a difference. One Life cares for AIDS orphans in South Africa, living in rural villages and townships, and at-risk children in India from poverty-stricken villages, and children in Laos and Thailand who have been rescued from or are at risk for child trafficking. We, and by we, I mean the people in this room, other churches, those joining us online, many of us have committed to take the time to give $38 per month to transform a kid's life by providing food, shelter, educational, and spiritual guidance that will give them a hope and a future. And today is your chance to join us as we change the world. We have 38 more kids awaiting sponsorship. And for the first time, well, before I, before I get into that, I'm gonna break script here a little bit because those 38 kids that are left, those are the old ugly ones, okay? Because the ones that are young and cute always get snatched up first, all right? Here's what you need to know about some of these older kids because sometimes you can see an age like 18, 19, think, why are we sponsoring a kid that, that old? You're thinking like an American. When a kid gets rescued from a gang at 14, has never been to school. 
when a girl who's been trafficked ever since she was this high and is 13 years old who has never been to school. Yeah, she might be 18, but she's going to kindergarten. And something you need to also know is that those older kids, just like any large family, they're the ones that get tasked with taking care of the younger ones. So when you get a chance to sponsor an older kid, it multiplies. It's actually a better deal for you, I'm telling you. And for the first time, we are not only offering opportunities to sponsor projects like birthday and Christmas gifts for the kids, but also for their further education. Because when their grade school is complete, we don't want a bunch of young adults on the street. Through further education, through that fund, they will get the skills training they need to become nurses, accountants, translators, tour guides, teachers, pastors, and business owners, especially the older kids. Never wonder if the hours you offer for their monthly sponsorship makes a difference, because I'm telling you, it does. In fact, it probably saves their lives. Now let's give a hand for those of you who already sponsor. Yes, thank you. For those of you who sponsor, here's how you can magnify your impact. You can write by making it personal. For many of our One Life kids, your letters are their only connection to a family that they don't have at home. No one else takes the time for them, but you can take 10 minutes of your chronos and connect with your child and turn it into a Kairos moment for them. Those letters and photos from their sponsor are more precious to them than you could ever imagine. Like Devi from India, who stashes everything she gets from her sponsor and rereads them all the time. Or Anoyo from South Africa, who was so excited about her letter from her sponsor when she was in class, she couldn't wait. She stood up and read it aloud to everybody, blessing everyone in, her, in the class there. Not only does your interest, love, and encouragement have lasting impact, but think about this for a minute. It also gives them specific ways of how to better pray and fast for you. Talk about return on time invested. And while writing is great, there's nothing quite like seeing someone face to face. You can go and make it real. By taking a trip, you'll have opportunities to see what Westside and One Life is doing globally. And for those who sponsor, an opportunity to visit their sponsored child. And I'll tell you something, when those kids see you face to face, you'll no longer be just their sponsor. You'll be like mom and dad to them. It'll be two weeks that will literally change your life. For many, it's been a huge Kairos moment for them. And I'm telling you right now, for some of you, it is go time. But if a two week investment seems like a lot, you could take just one hour today, right now, and explore. Figure it out. Life is too short to not do something now. Today, our whole global team is offering our time to you after the service in the Connection Center, in the lobby, and at 12.30 here, in about half an hour, at Lenex in the community room for a trip information meeting. You can ask all the questions you want. We'll even feed you lunch. Come on, free pizza, one hour, you can do this, all right? We're doing whatever it takes so that everybody, and I mean everybody, can offer their time in some way. Some of you will pray, others will sponsor, many will write, others will go, some will explore. Let me tell you, don't try to do everything, all right? Especially all at once. Do something. Don't waste your time. Your one and only life. Seize it. Carpe that diem. Don't let someday rob you of this day, our day. Let's stand and pray. Jesus, first off, we're grateful for the time that you have offered to us. Our time is yours. Give us the wisdom to make the most of every opportunity and the courage to take our time, our chronos, and redeem it for kairos moments that cause us to look back on our days with pride. And as we join in song together, may we as a community rise up and give ourselves away by offering our time to fulfill your purposes. Speak to each one of us right now how we can redeem our time, whatever that might be, to pray, sponsor, write, go, or explore. We give you permission to change our bucket list. And as we hear your voice and obey, let this time be our time 
our Kairos moment for each of us where we will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen.